How many times in my life have I done that? <laughs> well, as I said, it is a really fantastic, great privilege to be with you um, today. And um, actually, this was our first flight um, for two years, almost kind of to the day. So we thought, well, where should we go on our first flight? Where else? <laughs> but to come back to be with you guys has been absolutely amazing. In fact, we've been here since Wednesday. Um, and that's meant that we've been able to hook up with a lot of people and have a lot of uh, sharing with people uh, over the last few days. We've been able to uh, meet again with the trustees. We've had some evening meetings with people just uh, talking through. I and mean, if you're a visitor here today, um, obviously you're really, really welcome. But I'm here today to kind of share um, some things with you as a church community. Um, uh, I've been asked to just kind of make some comments um, on where we are obviously at as a church. And back in January, you would have heard the news that uh, Nathan is laying down his eldership, which uh, has come coming to an end at the end of uh, March. Um, and obviously that's been the end uh, of a really wonderful season. And I'm sure there's gonna be many opportunities to say thank you to Nathan for all that he's done as He's led uh, us through over what has not been an easy season um, together with everything else. But that is uh, obviously something happening. It's a decision that's been made. And so we come to the end of a season in a way for the life of the rock. And the wonderful thing about seasons when they come to an end is it does actually mean a new season is about to begin. And you see that in scripture that as one door shuts it's always that God has a plan for another door to open, even if you don't know exactly what that is. And this, of course, all results in change. And change is not an easy thing, especially after we've gone through the last couple of years. But here we are again as a church, and I've been coming out of here in and out since 1981. So I know that this church has been going through an awful lot of changes over these years. And change is not easy especially if you're going into a season where you kind of don't know what does this mean. It can be very unsettling. And if there's one thing, and I'm sure there are many, that you go through a global pandemic as a Christian that you do hopefully uh, learn and realize is though everything seems to be out of control and though you're not in control of your own life and the, the governments of nations are no longer in control, you do have to come to a place where you realize, but nevertheless, God is totally in control. And he knows what he's doing from the beginning to the end of things. And so as we go into this new season, as the rock, it means that there's no eldership team, for example. So what is our goal together? Our goal is to see a new eldership team uh, emerge uh, in the life of the rock, raised up in this community. That may include, these are things we're praying about and talking about, someone coming uh, from the outside to be a part of that. Um, but when I, when I say something like that, it, it often gives the impression, I think, of marking time. You know, I, I know some church situations where it's, if only we had a pastor and we're just waiting for the pastor. And it's kind of like nothing really happens until the pastor turns up. Not only do I think that's not actually biblical, but actually brings a passivity amongst us as a church community. And whether that happens or it doesn't happen, this is not a time for marking time. Amen? Amen. It's kind of like this church is full of really wonderful, remarkable people. And that means you don't depend on someone else, but you as a community have got so much to give. And this is a time of uncertainty and not knowing how it's going to shape up, but it's a time for everybody in this community to play its part. So please, don't, even tomorrow, don't go to the next day with a kind of passivity. This is a time for regathering. This is a time for rebuilding. And it's probably a time for patience as we do seek God for what he has for us. It really is a time for pulling together. I really hope you receive that. Not sitting back waiting for some magic wand, but actually really coming together as the people of God. COVID's strange. The whole, the whole two years, it's, 
it's been strange watching people kind of back off a bit. Obviously, <laughs> if you have to legally, then that's right. But that kind of mentality, and I don't think that should be our mentality during this next season as a church community, but rather the opposite. It should be a coming together. It's also an opportunity to reestablish a few things from our point of view. This has been dreadful having two years of not being able to come, not being able to visit, not to be able to be with you. That's how I feel. You might not feel like that at all, but that's how I kind of feel. And, and, and the reality is that's been difficult. It's been difficult locally for churches, but it's been difficult for those of us who are kind of working amongst churches. We've just been so limited. We were traveling. We were doing flights air two to three times a month year after year after year, and then suddenly it all comes to an end. And you feel, yeah, you can do Zoom calls and you can kind of do that sort of thing. But the reality is that we've been apart from one another. And I'm looking around this room and there's a whole load of you here. You have no idea who I am. Who is this old guy that Nathan's just got up on this platform? But there's an awful lot of you. You just look a little bit older than I last saw you two years ago. But apart from that, you kind of look the same. And we've been together for years and years and years. And so it's an opportunity, as you've been in isolation, probably more than any other church community I'm aware of in this family of churches, to really, really start to see that readdressed. So I'm really praying that as new ground gets on the road, the bigger family of new frontiers, that can often remind us, and it reminds me, that we're part of something that's much bigger than us. This is just such a wonderful thing that we're part of an international family all over the world. So for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, New Frontiers is a family of churches that's been around since, since the early 80s. We're now working 80 different nations. We have no idea how many churches are part of it, but we just know it's over 2,000, and it's growing all the time. And it's just so wonderful to be caught up in something that God is doing and not man's doing. And I trust that that will be part of our experience, but also that we want to support and serve you as a church community into this next season in every way that we can. Final thing I just want to say, because we are going to get to the Bible in a moment, is that um, one of the things we would love to do in the meantime is to create and establish what we'll call an interim leadership team. And that team's responsibility is to ensure that this church is led on a day-to-day -day basis and leads into the next phase um, of leadership that God has around the corner. This will take time and be, bear with us as we try to constitute this interim leadership team and who's on it and what the responsibilities um, will be. I have to say that it's strange, isn't it, to walk into a season and, and, and feel a bit leaderless, but the reality is um, there's just a sense of peace that God is in this and that God knows what he's doing. I'm actually quite calm. It's been a very stormy few days, is not it? I've often, I don't know why I just thought, yeah, storms. I feel quite calm in the midst of the storm, knowing that God has got this together, and we need to watch what God will do. I'm the sort of person, I'm not probably the only one in the room who likes to fix things. I'd love to just fix this, and I can't. And it's wonderful to be in that position of dependency upon God. Let's watch God at work. Let's see what God will do. I hope that's not too unsettling, but let's watch God. We've been here before. We can see him do things. Toyosi, who's just sitting over there, shared with me the other day, I was tempted to get you up here, actually. In fact, I'm still a bit tempted to get you up here. But time probably doesn't permit. But I, we were chatting away, and she just said she felt stirred about the story of Uzza, who was a guy who reached down. Do you remember that story when the Ark of the Covenant was falling off the car? And he had a, an unhappy ending. <laughs> um, and she was just saying, it's a bit like some of the seasons like we're going through as a church. You, you kind of want to get in, you kind of want to fix it, you kind of want to do something. And she was just sharing there are seasons when you just have to not touch what God is doing, but watch what God is doing. Of course, when the ark moved to different places and the ark was in the right place at the right time, that there was huge blessing. And that's what I believe God's going to do amongst you as a community. Shaky, uncertain, unknown, pulling together, really standing with one another, and then seeing God move. 
One thing that I've been uh, reminded of recently is just this one uh, uh, theological issue which is important for us. It's the principle that Jesus is always praying for you as an individual. He was praying for you when you woke up. We don't think about that very often. And he was praying for the rock. And he's praying for you as a local church and a people. And I just find that absolutely mind-boggling, that all through these two years, I've been up and down, my emotions have been all over the place. There have been times during these two years I've just not been doing well. And even though I've not been doing well, Jesus never stopped praying for me and praying for you. Don't beat yourself up if you've had a rotten time over these last two years. God loves you, and he has been doing more in you than you could even imagine. And I believe with all my heart that he's praying for you. It's a wonderful phrase where he turns to, to Peter and Jesus says, Satan has sought to sift you like wheat, wheat, but I have prayed for you. That your faith might not fail, fail and now go and strengthen your brothers. I believe that's a little word for you as a people. Jesus is praying for you. Don't let your faith fail and strengthen one another during this time. Can we just turn to the Bible? And what I want to do is share with you something which I hope will be relevant into all of this. Nathan asked me if I would spend a bit of time today. It's not so much a preach, but telling a story. He, would, he asked me if I could tell a bit of a story of the early days of New Frontiers um, because there are so many of you that are new. And it's actually a relevant word for some of you who are older because your memory is not what it used to be. So I'm going to remind you of some of the things that you might have even forgotten about. But when Nathan shared it to me, I thought, well, this is a bit tricky. I don't know how to do that. And then I really felt to actually talk about it slightly different and a bit about the past, but not in a nostalgic way, but making it relevant to where you as a church community are today. So if you have your Bibles, I just want to read from Genesis chapter 26 where it says this, now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments and my statutes and my laws. Just pause there just for a moment. Just those words will be very familiar if you know chapters beforehand, the story of Abraham. So God speaks to Abraham about him being blessed and the father of many nations. And there he, now God is speaking to his son a generation later and saying exactly the same thing to him. You are in the, the slipstream. You're in the blessing of what I promised to your father and now it's to you. The Bible talks about one generation to speak to another generation. This church has got more than one generation Looking around, you've got at least three generations. There's a little kid down here wearing a check shirt, and I was looking at him, and I thought, he's a really new Frontiers guy through and through. He's, wearing, he's about that high, and he's wearing a check shirt. Well done. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like one generation tell another should tell another because the blessings of the Lord are continuously there um, amongst us. Let's just go over to verse 12. Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him, and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants, so that the Philistines envied him. Now, this is a crucial verse, this next verse. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth the wells that his father's ser father servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we are. Just two more verses. So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, where the Philistines had, which the Philistines had stopped 
after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. Wells were really important in biblical times. They signified literally a life that was given for the community. Some of you come from nations around the world where your parents and grandparents would have spent a lot of time at Wells. It's a bit strange for us to kind of relate to it in our day and age, but they were places where communities gathered. They were places where life was given. They were places that were really, really important to have wells that were full of life and full of water that would spring forth. And so to block the wells was also very significant, but it was going to stop the blessing, going to stop the life that was going to be given to the people who are around them. And if you move on into the New Testament, you see wells are all over. Jesus was always at a well. He was always somewhere and he was talking about the well and not just the physical well, but the spiritual well. And if you come to me, you'll have life, rivers of living water and wells were a big deal in those biblical times, which is why they're used as an illustration for us. And of course, the, the, the implication of this is to translate the physical into the spiritual. In other words, there are generations who have gone before us who have dug wells. Our responsibility all these years is not to be nostalgic and look back at the good old days. By the way, they were not. And, uh, you know, those were the wonderful classic days. Because if a well has been dug, then that water is bubbling up underneath the surface of the life of the people who's, who will have the ownership of those wells. Even if they've been bunged up, and, 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 and shut down, they're still there. And so we have a responsibility to re-dig wells. And what I want to do today is just talk, yes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the early days of New Frontiers, how we were birthed, lessons learned, battles for history, prophetic promises, etc. But it's all so that you understand a generation dug wells and actually those wells are still there and we need to re-dig them once again. There can be an impartation. And it's true. I'm sorry this is going to be a little bit of a, of a, of a kind of history lesson, but it's true that a generation 40 plus years ago dug wells, and it's true of you. I was here when a generation was raised up and dug wells. And we have loads of wells that have been dug in the rock over the years. Loads of wells. I mean, the story of New Frontiers is the story of the rock. It's not like one or the other. It's the same story. And there are lots of them. The wells of grace, the wells of prayer, the wells of the supernatural, the wells of the prophetic, the wells of being a diverse people, the wells of being a people with purpose to the ends of the earth. A generation before a lot of you were here in this place lived and breathed and preached and pioneered and fought battles for those kind of wells to be dug. I'm just going to mention three of them because I'm a preacher. Three of them that are important. The first is what I would call the well of the word and spirit. The, the, the well of the word and spirit. Some of these things are generalizations, but please bear with me. Back in the 60s, in the UK church scene, there, raised, there, there emerged a generation that started to believe there was more to their Christian lives than they were experiencing. They were hungry. They were thirsty. They didn't know quite what for, but something big was missing in their lives. And this was happening globally, but it's happening in the UK, and it was happening right across all denominations. Every, everywhere you went during that time, there was this growing sense there's something missing, there must be more. And that led to the, a discovery of what it was. And the discovery was the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it's kind of like everybody knew that they'd been born of the Spirit, but the thing that's been missing is this strange member of the Trinity. We kind of know a lot about the Father and the Son, and then, ooh, a little bit kind of, I remember as a little kid being told, you know, just, be, just, just beware, 
I, I, I remember the phrase, the Holy Ghost, and it used to frighten me. He used to think, oh, he's like a ghost then, is he? I mean, it doesn't mean that, but that's what I thought as a kid. So he's kind of ghostly, weird, strange, to be avoided, especially if you're British, you know, it's just not the thing to do. But this hunger and desire led to the rediscovery of this person of the Spirit. And I want you to notice, ironically, lots of people came to that place because they were studying the, the Word of God. The sadness in the evangelical world is there seems to become a separation between word and spirit. And so you have churches that are really, really strong on the word and very nervous about the spirit. And there are churches that are all guns blazing about the spirit. And they're really nervous of the word because they think the word will quench the spirit. The Bible never separates those two. The Bible talks about them as friends. Jesus said, at a well, incidentally, there will come a day when you will worship in spirit and in truth. So in the scripture, you'll feel what the world has separated is just there together. And the well that has been dug across the, the history of New Frontiers, when hundreds of people started to say, God, what is it that's missing? For individuals, it resulted in people being baptized in the Holy Spirit and moving in the gifts of the Spirit for the first time and knowing the power of the Spirit to be witnesses. And if I can say this, knowing a freedom that they'd never known before, knowing a joy that was almost overwhelming that they'd never known before. And corporately, it resulted in churches like the rock coming into being. It wasn't just about individuals being empowered by God through the baptism of the Spirit. It was about a learning of a whole community called the church. And this was going across all denominations. And sadly, for some of us, it resulted in us not being able to stay where we were, but going on a journey to dig this well properly because we felt we couldn't dig it where we were. It's very disruptive in so many ways, but it was absolutely vital. And you may not know this, but this church community exists Exactly the same through those times when corporately we were learning about worship and corporately meetings were coming alive. Meetings were spontaneous and full of expectation and, 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 and really believing that the presence of God was the dominating feature in our lives. These were huge changes and believe you me, there were massive battles and disruption and difficulties. It wasn't all glory, hallelujah. But the family of churches we're a part of, New Frontiers, was birthed in the Spirit. That's what I want you to know. It was birthed as a result of the move of the Spirit. It was birthed not by man, but by God, sovereignly moving. And at that time, new churches and streams and networks and denominations, all sorts of things, were being overwhelmed by being birthed in the Spirit. And the rock, which wasn't called that in those days, came into being exactly the same. I was here, I was, in, I was in meetings where it all started. The word and spirit has been dug in this church. There's a deep well here of the word and the spirit. And the Christian landscape's changed dramatically as the years have gone by. It's now very, very different. And yet, there is a real danger 40 years later. This is what I want to home in just quickly. Because 40 years later, things that were full of wonder can now become very, very over-familiar. Things that you thought, wow, can now be taken for granted. Uh, things that, you know, were, were, were just so precious can be just kind of, well, easy come, kind of easy go. Yet there's, so, there's a, such, a, such a need a generation later for this well to be redug again. So that we don't fall into the trap of over-familiarity. You know, there's a famous phrase, one generation fights, another generation later on assumes, and then the third generation loses it. We talk a lot about this. So much so that some people think it's like a church logo. It's not. It's not supposed to be good news. <laughs> it's said so that we can understand that is not the will of God. 
The will of God, if there was a generation that fought for something, the next one doesn't assume and doesn't lose, but we keep it. How on earth are we going to keep it 40 years later? The same way that they kept it right at the beginning. How was that? They were hungry. They were thirsty. And the well was brought. You think of that, you know, Jesus speaking in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. Come to me, all who are hungry, all who are thirsty, and I will give you a drink and rivers of living water will flow from within you. That doesn't change as history goes by. You think, well, I'm so grateful that there was a generation who dug this well of the word and spirit. I think, well, that was 40 years ago, so what are we going to do? What happened 40 years ago? People came, and they were thirsty, and they were given a drink. Do you know how we're going to unblock this well? We need to come thirsty all over again. And if, you, if this church thirsts, even in the next few weeks and months at this time of uncertainty, I guarantee rivers of living water will begin to flow again. The Holy Spirit will begin to move again because you're coming hungry and thirsty. And the promise is that he will do this. And it's full of action. It's not passive. It's something you and I do. We come, we drink, we receive of what God has for us. I live with this nervous fear that my grandkids, I've got a lot of them, okay, that my grandkids will just hear stories of what granddad and grandma used to experience of the things of the Spirit. And there's something really sad about that. I want my grandkids to experience what I experienced. I want them to have their own encounter with the Spirit of God. I want them to have their stories. I want them to be in church communities that are just full of expectation and wonder and thrill again. Surely it cannot be that it's a past nostalgic thing, but a present reality. Amen. Second well. That was a long one. It's all right. Second well. That would be quicker. Really, and you, this is another thing you can take for granted, but really important, and that is this. The whole thing of being a family. The whole emphasis of being relational. Believe it or not, there was a day when church was very formal, very non-relational. We're kind of like billiard balls. We kind of come into a meeting on Sunday and all bounce off one another and go back home. And woe betide you if you got too close. And then suddenly a generation rose up and think, hang on a minute. When I look at the word, here we are again, and I'm now being baptized with the Holy Spirit, and experiencing the things of the Spirit. What I see in the Word of God is a community of people who love one another and care for one another. In fact, the phrase one another comes 58 times in the New Testament alone. It's a real hint that church is supposed to be something radically different. And 40 years ago, the emphasis everywhere as people dug this well was also this journey. That we must get back to the model of the New Testament And that we must become a people where there's a huge emphasis on relating to one another, of doing life together, of being a community. The vocabulary of the New Testament is really, really important. I'm going to upset some people, I'm sure, but you don't see an organizational vocabulary. Organization is not unimportant, it's just secondary. It's secondary because we're not an organization, we're a family. So you don't hear about line managers and executive status. You hear about brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers. You you hear the language of affection. You only have to read Philippians 1 when Paul is expressing his affection for the church at Philippi. I mean, the words he uses, I yearn for you, I love you, I can't. And you get into Corinth and he says, you are my joy and I love you. And I think if I was part of Corinth, I would disown them on the spot. I mean, look at them. What a mess. Paul says, I love you. And he knows they're a mess. But it's affection and it's warmth and it's fathering. And this is the language of the New Testament. And so the Christian community met in homes. They did life together in homes. You, read, you only have to read Acts 2, 42 to 47 and realize it was not about buildings and it was not about occasionally popping in on a Sunday for an hour and a half when I could fit it in. If you had said to any of those Christians in Acts chapter 2, are you going to church on Sunday or Saturday, it would have been those days in the Sabbath, they wouldn't have even understood the concept. Please, can you repeat the question? I don't understand that. Because for them, they were doing life seven days a week. 
It was like the norm of their life. It was hospitality. And folks, that's there in Scripture. Read it for yourselves. Don't take my word for it. That's the atmosphere of what church is meant to be. That's the church Jesus is building, by the way. And that passion was re-dug 40 years ago of a church that was thinking, we're not just going to go to a building and go on Sundays. We're going to do life together. We're going to be a family. We're going to get into one another's lives. The revelation that church is not about drawing a crowd. It's about making disciples. And you can't make disciples very much in a meeting for an hour and a half, but you can do if everybody's doing life together. Because you're all in life together and you're making disciples of one another. I have friends. I have one particular friend before COVID. His church was just mushrooming. I mean, just hundreds and hundreds of people. And he chatted to me. It was about six months before COVID. And he said, I, I'm loving it. It's very successful, I think. He said, but I'm not making any disciples. It's just a crowd. And I don't know who they are. And you know what? I have no idea what to do about it. I don't know how to get out of the trap that I'm in. And six months later, COVID hit. And I spoke to him three months after. He said, David, the Lord answered my prayers. I thought, what are you on earth are you talking about? He said, well, everyone's scattered. There's no more building. There's no more crowd. It's all gone. When we reconstitute, and this is what he's done radically, he's changed the wineskin totally. Yeah, he still has Sunday meetings, and they are important. I'm not undermining that. And the people kind of get there. And but life is now done. <laughs> In the homes. He's built the whole church again. One it's actually an uncomfortable church to go to now if you just want to rock up on Sundays because you're constantly being told another narrative. And I think that we are, post COVID is going to be fascinating. I'm really praying for a church to emerge that's not about buildings and Sundays and performance and that sort of stuff, but it's about a church that really learns to be family and do life together where the few that do everything are replaced by the most who do everything. Where there is an emphasis on being a body, in 1 Corinthians 12, where everyone has a part to play. That COVID has actually provided us a pause button and a reflection moment, where we as a church of the rock can say, do we want to redig that well again? I mean, it's a bit inconvenient. Something a bit costly about people doing life together. Some people in the church, I just can't even imagine doing life with. And it's kind of like, that's the emphasis that's starting to emerge more and more. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's countercultural. So many people in COVID have been isolated. And my theory is that, that as we come out, people will come out, they will go to the shops, and, but inside, something's changed, something's died. They don't, they're not sure. They don't want to get, they're fearful. We as a community have an opportunity to radically model something completely different. Where there's genuine love and care and unity and we're not just isolated physically and, and standing against that isolation, but inwardly we're not allowing that to happen at all. There's a lot more I could say about that. We haven't got time. Third and final thing is mission. I think, if I'm honest, when I look back on the early days that, that I was involved in, as this family of churches called New Frontiers that was coming into to be birthed, this wasn't one of the worlds. We were, so into, we were so into the word and spirit and family, we thought that was it. This is so much better than it used to be. There wasn't a lot of talk about outreach and reaching people. We didn't even have that on our agenda very much. But as time went by, we began to realize that if God has brought us together as a family of churches, it must be for a reason. What is that reason? And a new well began to be dug. And the well was this. We have come together for the purpose of mission. That we together can't be just a nice family that looks at one another every week, but actually we've come together to make an impact upon all those who don't know Jesus and don't know good news and don't know the power of the gospel to transform their lives. And this resulted in a huge revolution. The reason that New Frontiers is now whatever it is in so many nations is because of this. I'm really grateful to God. We dug the well of word and spirit. We dug the well of family, but it didn't stop there. We dug the word, the well of mission. 
So people were mobilized, people were sent, people planted churches. People were provoked by hearing what other churches were do doing. And as local churches, churches began to become far more missional in terms of an understanding that our very existence on an island like Guernsey is not to be complete in ourselves, but we're here for the purpose of reaching the thousands who do not yet know who Jesus is. That's why we exist. And to be quite honest with you, we could grow through church transfer. And this island does grow through church transfers of people moving. There's nothing massively wrong with that. You know, God's bigger than all of that. But what about all those who've never even heard of Jesus? Who haven't even thought this morning that why would I ever go to a church building? Why would I ever do that? It's irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. These are the very people as to why a well was dug in the spirit and why a well was dug to be a family is not an end in itself, but a means to reaching all of those who do not yet know Jesus. And you know, we as a church here, we exist for many, many good reasons, and they're all valid. But the overall reason must be that we are good news people to people who do not know Jesus. And COVID has got to result, please, brothers and sisters, hear this. This is my plea. It results in a church who understands if we've been going through difficult times ourselves, and we all have, Christians go through what everybody else goes through, by the way. Here's the difference. We know that God has been with us through it all. If you don't know that, then despair and hopelessness and a sense of bewilderment this is why there's so many health issues everywhere. It's because the difference is you have no hope. There's no God. There's no purpose. There's no reason. And people die. It's really quite depressing. <laughs> and slowly but surely, this well needs to be redug again because there has been a well dug in the DNA of this church. And all we've got to do is unplug it. Like those Philistines that come along as the years go by and they, they, they close down the word and spirit and they close down the emphasis of family. And you don't do it overnight. You know, the whole emphasis of family, is you just slowly drift back to a building. You slowly drift back to organization. It's subtle. You don't even notice it's happening. And then you wake up and you think, oh, it's not what it used to be. Redig the well that was there beforehand. And a well, I believe, has been dug in this church of desire for mission. And over the years, you've done all sorts of things to reach out to people. But it's not a time to stop. And <laughs> it's the time to redig it again. Back in our church, our local church, which where Liz and I come from in southeast London, one of the things we're doing coming out of COVID is we're actually rebooting all our small groups. We call them communities. And we're rebuilding them around geography because we've got 880,000 people in three boroughs where we live. That's a lot of people, right? And we need to go and reach them. And our people now live quite widespread, thousands and thousands of people all around them. And so we're creating communities um, in those geographic locations. And it's, it's, I just thought this would be like a doddle. It's really, really hard work. And a lot of people are struggling with it. And here's why they're struggling. I was talking to a couple of the other day. They said, we have lived in our road for 30 years. And we have done everything in the book the Bible, and we've made up some more things in order to try and reach these people, and we have had no fruit whatsoever. So when you start about us, we, kept, we start a community, they're kind of they're like this before they've even started. But I believe they will get there and come through for this reason, they're going to redig this well again. Jesus said to, to his disciples who had caught nothing all night, he said, go back. I don't know if you've thought this. Go back and fish again in the same place and put down your nets, and this time you'll get a great harvest. And I just can't you imagine those disciples that only just met Jesus rowing out to the same place. Why on earth? We, we are professional. We are fishermen. We've just done this all night. Who said we should go out and fish again? The carpenter. What does he know about fishing? But when they let down their nets in the same place and they saw this abundant supply, they realized he wasn't the carpenter. He was the son of God. In fact, if you read that text, they said they were undone because they realized who was amongst them. 
and a post-COVID world, we now have, 40 years on from where this church started, and two years of COVID, a whole new generation. It's interesting what uh, Nathan was talking earlier about being confused, because I've got this in my notes. I've actually written down, we have a now a new confused generation who have never heard the good news of the gospel. It's interesting for, for Liz and me, we, we, we don't live here, so we come in from the outside, and whenever we come here, we just are overwhelmed about, whoa, how wonderful to be in a church, because look at all these thousands of people who are not going anywhere, who all live where you live and work where you work, thousands of people all around. The temptation for the rock is to think, we've been here for 40 years, We've seen some fruit. There's been wonderful stories and people have come to the Lord, but we just got through COVID. We're surviving. The last thing we want to do is go and reach out. And I get that. We're still in a time of recovery. This isn't a quick fix, but there's a well in this church that needs to be redug again, which is the well of believing that there are people who are going to come to know Jesus. When we walk around this island or drove or try to walk through the wind, um, you just keep meeting people, poor, isolated, suffering, marginalized. You also see tons of people who look like they're well-to-do, doing really great, not a problem in the world. Under the surface, that's not true. Under the surface, there's terrible emptiness and sadness and loss and questions and wondering about the purpose and the meaning of life. The other thing we always get struck when we come here is that the nations of the world are here. Where I live in London, the nations of the world are. I just don't see Here you see them everywhere. They're here. Why? So that we can reach them and we can share the, the gospel of Jesus. I think it's an amazing place to live. And the great opportunities. So one of the, the, the things that we're pioneering, and come to a close, one of the things we're pioneering, we finish at 12, right? So we all, we all turn into pumpkins at 12 o'clock. Okay, right. um, one, of, one of the things that, that we're pioneering as a family of churches is reaching the Portuguese-speaking world. Is there anybody here this morning who speaks Portuguese? I'm, just, I'm not going to get you to... Anybody? No one. Okay. So we're developing the Portuguese. We have amazing opportunities uh, partnering with guys down in Zimbabwe into Mozambique, which is po po Portuguese-speaking. Liz and I have been there but into Brazil, where the churches are on the process of joining us as a family, into Portugal itself, and everywhere we go, I just keep... And I'm here, and there are thousands of Madeiran people on this island whose first language is Portuguese. Catarina, who's been our servant in our hotel this week. We've got ultra... Liz this morning just hugged her as we parted company, and she didn't know what to do about it, but kind of got enveloped in Liz's hug and stayed there, thinking, this is unusual for Guernsey, but I'm enjoying it. And there's this whole crowd of people on your doorstep. And one of the things I'm really going home motivated to talk to some of our Portuguese-speaking people and saying, is there any way we can get into the rock and start to reach some of the... Can you imagine... Gathering some of them, most of them from Catholic kind of backgrounds, but gathering them, talking to them about Jesus and beginning to integrate with them. I'm sorry, I mustn't get carried away, but it's just, these are the possibilities. Please don't say we've done it. Please don't say we dig that, we dug that well 40 years ago. Listen, there's a whole generation that weren't there 40 years ago and they're here and they don't know Jesus. Should we just close our eyes just for a moment? Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come and take hold of your word and sow it like a seed into our hearts. Some of us are here this morning and we're wondering, what, what, what's the future hold? It's kind of, there's no eldership team at the moment. I don't know what the vision is. What's the five-year plan? Some of us like that sort of stuff. and We don't really know how to answer those questions. Can I encourage you this morning here while we're waiting for all that to get sorted and watch what Jesus will do. In the meantime, here's the vision. Listen, this is the vision these coming weeks and months, 2022. Redig the word and spirit 
redig the well of family and relationships and begin to redig the well of mission. Because this is going to result, not waiting for a pastor to come, but this is going to result in fresh life, more of the presence of God, and even growth. Wow. As people come to know Jesus. I'm just praying this. My heart is, some of us are thinking, okay, I can see that in the word and I believe it. It sounds like a good thing to go for. How on earth are we going to do it? Listen, it happens naturally. You and I can redig this well here. When you bump into somebody in this church in town, start to have a conversation with one another and start to redig the well in that conversation. Just bumping into one another, talking about the spirit and the word and relationships and mission. When you're in small groups, start redigging the well. What an opportunity. See the life begin to bubble up. When you gather as a church, when you are here on Wednesday in the prayer meeting, all of these are redigging wells, opportunities. When you're just two or three friends gathered around for a coffee, just start to talk and imagine them. You'll find the well will be unblocked again. You'll find that the living water starts to flow. Don't get over concerned about all the trappings of what's going to happen next, but you can redig these wells. And Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, you will help this community. It's been tough two years and we're still regathering and we've still got a long way to go and there are people still wounded and hurt. We, we know that and we'll take as long as it takes to help people. But oh Lord, in the meantime, thank you for the wells of a former generation that fought battles and did some amazing things in order to cause life to come. And here we are these years later and I thank you that just like Isaac discovered that the wells of his father Abraham could be redug, help us to redig the wells of a former generation. Please don't allow us to talk about nostalgic stories of the past, but to live in the reality of even more than our forefathers experienced. Because Jesus, you are alive, and the Holy Spirit has never been in lockdown. He's always been free and always been moving. Now, those hidden things, let them come to the surface, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.